Welcome everyone. I'm Paul Peppis, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center at the University of Oregon. Thanks for joining us for another online edition of the uh, OHC's regular work in progress talks, presentations given by faculty and graduate students who are current research fellows at the Oregon Humanities Center, speaking about their research projects. If you have a question at the end of the talk, please use the chat feature of Zoom. I'll moderate and ask the questions. We've also enabled the closed captioning function of Zoom. You can activate captions using the live transcript option. The talk is being recorded and will be available for viewing later today on the Oregon Humanities Center's website and YouTube channel. Before introducing today's speaker, I also wanted to share news of an upcoming event sponsored by the Oregon Humanities Center, the final lecture in this year's named lecture series on the theme of climate justice. Brown University environmental historian Bathsheba DeMuth will deliver the 2020-2021 Robert D. Clark Lecture in the Humanities, titled The Reindeer and the End of the World, on Tuesday, May 7th at noon Pacific time, live via Zoom. You can register for the lecture through the OHC's website at ohc.uoregon.edu. I'm pleased now to introduce our speaker for today, Stephen Bita, Assistant Professor of History at the University of Oregon. He is a 2020-21 OHC Faculty Research Fellow. Professor Bita's research interests include 20th century US history, labor history, and environmental history. His research specifically explores the history of workers in the Northwest's timber industry and the ways rural communities have adapted to the region's changing economy. He has also researched and written about the history of forestry, rural protest movements, and the rise of the Northwest's militia movement. Professor Bita's work in progress talk, part of his current book project, is titled Strong Winds and Widowmakers, A History of Workers, Nature, and Environmental Conflict in the Pacific Northwest Timber Country, 1900 to the Present. Welcome, Steve. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Paul, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and also, again, thank you to, to Paul and to Peg and to everyone else at uh, OHC for organizing these talks. Um, you know, we, we're, we're all in the pandemic for a while now, so it's still wonderful to be able to be part of a intellectual community and, and converse with everyone. And of course, a huge thank you to the OHC for this um, fellowship quarter. I am finishing up revisions on this project. And so to have this time off to work and really dedicate myself to the kind of last few things uh, to get this thing done um, is really helpful and beneficial. So um, let me go ahead and fire up the PowerPoint. And okay, um, so as Paul said, I'm gonna kind of give you a, a quick um, overview of my current book project, which is titled Strong Winds and Widowmakers, A History of Work, Nature, and Environmental Conflict in Pacific Northwest Timber Country, 1900 to the present. Um, and to give you kind of a sense of what the book is about and kind of some of the major themes of the book, I want to start off with, with a story. Um, and this is actually the story that starts off the intro to the book. So I'm I'm not ruining anything for you. You, you should still buy the book and read it when it comes out. Um, so this, uh, this story takes place in the Sayward Valley on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. And I should say for the purposes of my, my research and this, this particular project, I define the Northwest as including British Columbia. Um, so the, this, like I said, this story takes place in the Sayward Valley, a very kind of rural and remote, remote corner of Vancouver Island. It is coal country. It is also timber country. It is a, a rough part of the Vancouver Island. It is a hardworking part of Vancouver Island. And this story takes place on May 29th, 1990. So on that day, three timber fellers, they worked for McMillan Bladell, which was the largest timber company on Vancouver Island and definitely the largest employer in the Sayward Valley. Uh, they get an assignment from their foreman and to go to part of the White River, um, which you see in the background here, go to part of the White River and fell about a 20 acre chunk of, of timber. 
And when the three men get there, and again, getting to these timber tracks is often a long and arduous process. They had to drive over gravel and grutted roads. Then they have to carry chainsaws deep into the forest, uh, up and down steep hills. Uh, when, the, when the three men finally arrive at the timber track they're supposed to cut, what they find it is, is that is a, it is a remarkably old growth stand of timber. So in this part of Vancouver Island, the average age of an old growth forest is probably 80 or 90 years. An older, older growth forest will be about 150 years. Um, and those trees will be about anywhere between 100 and 150 feet tall. When the three men arrive in this grove, they see that the trees are upwards of 200 feet tall. They are bigger at the trunk than anything they have ever seen. Um, and, and the men know immediately that this is an extremely old growth forest and foresters would later confirm that some of the trees in this grove were more than 400 years old, which is very, very rare in a Pacific Northwest forest. So without even talking about it, the three men say, we're not going to cut it. After hiking into the forest, they pack up their tools, they turn around, they head back for their truck and they start driving back to the town of Stayward. And they intend to tell their employer, Bledel, Bledel, yeah, excuse me, McMillan Bledel, that they aren't going to cut the stand. And so this is a picture that appeared in the three men's uh, union newspaper, the IWA Canada, uh, of them standing in the grove. And you can just see kind of how big these, these trees are. Uh, and you see at the bottom there, the, the caption reads, Fallers Risky Decision. And this was a risky decision essentially then saying, we are not gonna cut this grove. You can fire us if you want, but we're not gonna cut it. This was a risky decision because of everything else going on at this time in the spring of 1990. So the preceding five years had been, you know, marked this kind of peak of environmental activism in the Northwest where environmental activists, sometimes radical environmental activists really intervened to put pressure on state forestry boards, provincial forestry boards, and the federal government to significantly curtail harvests. A lot of this activism was centered on the spotted owl, which you see here. The spotted owl's native range really didn't extend into British Columbia, but even there, there was a new movement to protect so-called ancient forests, old forests, and that again forced the provincial government to restrict a a lot of logging. Um, and as a result of these new harvest restrictions and as a result of new efforts to protect the spotted owl, unemployment throughout Northwest timber country was higher than it had ever been. And in some places, the unemployment rate exceeded what it had been in the depression. So essentially, you know, in May of 1990, work in the timber industry is extremely hard to come by. All these towns, including the town of Sayward, were single industry towns where if you didn't work for the timber industry, you probably didn't work. And here these three men are putting their jobs on the line in order to preserve this kind of small, roughly 20 acre grove that no one really had known existed before you know, they refused to cut it. Um, so the way the story wrapped up was, you know, the men returned to town, they say they're not gonna cut it. Almost immediately within like, hours, they're, the local of their union, the IWA says, uh, no one from our local is going to cut this grove either. And if you fire Luoma, Zap, or Morrison, you are going to have, you know, we're going to resist that. Um, my favorite part of the story is that everyone, you know, a bunch of people from the town, many of them unemployed loggers, then went to the grove and set up a protest camp and said, no one from Sayward is going to cut this grove. And if you try and bring in anyone else, we are going to he we're here and we're not going to allow them to cut the grove. Um, so it's, um, you know, I, I think it's an interesting story. And it's the story I start my book off with and the story I'm starting this talk off with, because I think what it reveals is a more complex or it reveals some of the more complex ways that people who live and work in the timber industry and in timber communities know and understand and think about the forest. The, the, the dominant narrative
narrative, the, the one that you'll find in the news media, even some kind of histories is that when, when working people and working class people, particularly rural working class people, see nature, they simply see an economic space. They see a space that supports them, their jobs, their communities. And that is absolutely true. But what I really endeavor to show in this project, and what I think this story shows is that there, there's more to it than just work, is that when, when people from rural timber country see the forest, they, see, they do see a space of work, but they see something else. They see a place that is worth preserving and protecting, sometimes even if that costs them their jobs. Um, so really what my book charts and tries to understand is, is kind of the longer history of how working people from the rural Northwest have understood the forest, try and understand what the forest has meant to them and try and understand the various ways they have thought about protecting it and the ways, you know, the ways they've tried to balance their, the economic, you know, their economic need for jobs with the other values they ascribe to forest spaces. Um, so that's really the, the main question uh, that is driving this book. Um, now, one of the things is, you know, we historians, you know, Sometimes we'll, we'll say, uh, I found some unused evidence or I found this archive that no one has known about and it completely changes the story. One of the shocking things for me when I started this project was, was how not hidden stories of working class conservation and working class environmentalism are. If you spend five minutes reading the, the union newspapers of the mid 20th century, you will see a concern for force conservation. Um, if you spend any amount of time speaking with timber workers, you will quickly see that they, they oftentimes identify as conservationists. Um, they rarely identify as environmentalists only because in you know, parts of the rural Northwest, that, that term has you know, bad connotations, but they often identify as conservationists. So this isn't necessarily a hidden story, but it is a story that I think other scholars and you know, the general public has not paid attention to. So in addition to understanding how working people have related to the forest and how they've sought to protect it, one of the, the, the questions my book tries to answer is why aren't stories like Luoma, Zapp, and Morrison's better known? And for that matter, why isn't the role that working people have played in Northwest forest conservation better known? Um, and then kind of the, the final question, um, you know, I, I answer in the kind of, you know, present day import of, of my project is, is to try and suggest that, you know, if maybe we knew these stories better, forced use conflicts might be a little less vitriolic. Um, so again, anyone who pays attention to contemporary Northwest environmental politics, and you don't even have to pay close attention, know that we, we still fight over forests and how they should be used. Um, you know, some of you here listening to me are probably old enough to remember the Spotted Owl conflict, um, but even after the Spotted Owl conflict abated, um, other conflicts emerged about old growth forests and ancient forests and how they should be managed. Um, most recently, uh, a new movement, the timber unity movement has emerged in response to climate change legislation. And we're again having a debate about how forests and forests you know, should be used. Um, just on my way to campus this morning, uh, I heard that Jerry Franklin and um, Norm Thomas, who are kind of, you know, th they were authors of the Northwest Forest Plan, which was one of the kind of chief policy proposals that brought the spotted owl conflict to an end. Um, they were going to be interviewed on NPR this afternoon um, about uh, they are opposing a recent old growth timber sale. So, so we're still constantly debating about how forests should be used. Um, and, and oftentimes in these debates, workers are pitted as the enemies, enemy of conservation, as the enemy of forest protection. And you know, one of the goals of this project is to show that you know there's a long history in timber country of working people trying to balance the need, their need for jobs with the aesthetic and biological values of the forest. And if we listen to them, perhaps forest conflicts would be a little bit less acrimonious. And that's not to say I think that timber workers and environmentalists are always going to agree. But if they, they both kind of encountered one another with a common understanding that both shared an interest and both valued the forest for more than just work, I think some of these conflicts could be a little bit less, you know, mean spirited um, and a little and a lot more productive. And so that's kind of one of the goals of this book. All right, so I start this story in the early 20th century. Um, one of the things was, you know, I started getting interested in this, 
you know, this topic of kind of the, the environmental history of timber workers, you know, I found stories like Lou Zepp and Morrison's really early on. Um, and I kind of kept tracing this way of thinking back in time. I, I kind of kept expecting like, well, at some point I'm going to find that, you know, timber workers didn't care about the, the environment. And then at some point they started to care about it. And that's where I'm going to start my story. But I kept going back and back in time until I find myself in the early 1900s uh, with the kind of birth of the, the Northwest timber industry. So that is where I start my story. Um, so my narrative roughly breaks down into three parts. The, the, the first part, place, examines the, the origins of the timber industry in the early 20th century, how workers came to be part of the Northwest timber industry, and ultimately how they understood the forest and how the forest shaped their understandings of community and class and the way the forest became really embedded in their lives. Part two, power, uh, turns to the depression and then labor organizing thereafter. And it looks, it primarily focuses on the international woodworkers of America. They were the dominant union in the Pacific Northwest timber industry throughout the mid 20th century. And one of the things that's notable about the, the IWA and one of the things I cover um, in my book is just how involved they were in forest conservation and that many wilderness areas and a lot of legislation that we, we hold dear or a lot of environmental activists hold dear today uh, was the IWA was a part of that history. Um, and and then the, the third part, problems, 1970s to the present, really looks at uh, um, you know, what happened, why it looks at the decline of organized labor. But more than that, it looks at the ways in which environmental conflict and conflicts between workers and environmentalists came to dominate forestry, pol forestry politics. So, so that's the, the general arc of, of the story. Um, so like I said, I, I begin with uh, the origins of the Northwest timber industry in the 1900s when a lot of the large, big kind of Midwestern timber firms, among them Weyerhaeuser, that was the biggest one, but, but several others, when they came to the Northwest, they started buying up a lot of timberland and they started um, recruiting tens of thousands of workers to come work in the woods and the mills. Um, now most historic, you know, a lot has been written about timber workers. I'm, I'm far from the first person to write a history of timber workers. But for the most part, historians have focused on the sorts of images you see on your screen here. That is to say work. That is to say, you know, the, the, the labor process and the ways in which kind of timber workers knew nature through labor. And, and I don't deny that work is hugely important. Um, I have an entire chapter on work and the labor process. I think it's really, really important to understand. Um, also the ways it created dangers for workers and how they navigated these, these dangerous landscapes. That's all really important to understand. But one of the big things that my book does and what I hope is one of my contributions to, to both labor history and the field of labor environmental history where I work is to suggest that we can't just focus on work to understand the ways in which nature was important for workers. So I spend a lot of time looking and studying at the places workers lived and the places from about 1900 until the start of the depression in the 1930s the places most workers lived were in company towns. You see one company town pictured here. Um, and if you get a sense from this picture, these were not easy places to live. Um, you know, one of the things I say in my book is the, the you can get a sense that nature was part of their lives because the, the boundaries separating the human and natural worlds were very, very porous. You see these, these homes are very poorly constructed. Wind and the elements got through them. They leaked. Uh, profusely, rodents crawled into them. So there were these kind of no clear boundaries between the human and natural worlds in logging company towns. Now, the reason for logging company towns, there were, there were several reasons that employers adopted company towns. Um, the first one was just practical. Uh, early 20th century logging is taking place on the region's hinterlands. Um, you can't employ an urban workforce because transporting them to logging sites would just take too long. So it's a geographic necessity. Also, it serves to keep workers isolated from uh, the radical labor movement. Um, and they were pretty effective in keeping workers isolated from the radical labor movement. Um, now, the thing is, is that early 20th century timber companies, their goal was the, the famous colloquial phrase is cut out and get out. Their, their goal was to liquidate their forest holdings as quickly as possible and then disinvest from the region as quickly as possible. 
So they didn't want to put a lot of cap or invest a lot of capital into constructing really nice housing for workers. Um, so they really built shoddy, poorly built homes. The other thing is that the, the timber industry in the early 20th century was very, very mobile. Um, so workers might be at a site like this for one or two years. And then after all those forests were cut, they would have to leave and, and build a new town. Um, so again, employers didn't want to sink a lot of money into towns. And these made these these towns, you know, really, really difficult places to live. And I spent a lot of time recounting all the difficulties. Um, but one of the things that surprised me is when I started looking at the ways that workers talked about company town life, they often remembered it at a, alongside remembering the, the, the difficulties, they also remembered it as happy. You know, there were parts of it that were really happy. And, and one of the things that made it kind of enjoyable for some workers was the strong sense of community. Um, and what a lot of workers attributed this to was the fact that, you know, when you're living in a remote company town, uh, when you have very little provided for you by employers, you have to rely on your neighbors and your family to get by. So the, these communities were very, very tightly knit. And that was one of the things that made it enjoyable. The other thing, and one of the, the really important things I talk about in my book is that because these places were difficult to live, because they had very few amenities, because you couldn't just run down to the supermarket when you needed you know, food for dinner, uh, workers had to come to rely on the forest. Um, one of the things that shocked me when, when I started doing this research is the number of memoirs that talk in almost religious terms about blackberries uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Here you see in this background picture, women picking blackberries. Um, but workers would talk about blackberries and the joys of blackberry picking, um, you know, they go on and on about it. And that was kind of one of the moments when I realized like, oh, there's more to the relationship to the forest here than just formal wage labor. Um, also workers talked a lot about hunting, hunting deer and hunting grouse. Um, that was another kind of crucial space of subsistence. Also the forest became another, a really crucial place of recreation. Again, recreational facilities were not something most employers provided. So workers would, you know, they would hike um, in some parts of timber country and higher elevation parts of timber country. Workers would make skis and they'd go skiing. Um, so I have all these wonderful stories about the, the various ways that timber workers use the forest. And so what I ultimately argue in this, this kind of section um, and what I think is important kind of in the, this first section of the this story um, is that working people use the forest in a variety of ways. And ultimately it came to have multiple meanings, um, multiple meaning in their life. So it was, mo it was absolutely an important place of work, but it was also an important place of recreation, of subsistence, and ultimately a, pla a place that was a, a foundation of their communities. And what they came to believe was that proper forest management needed to balance all the multiple ways they knew and relied on forests and nature. That yes, they needed to fell trees because that was how they sustained themselves economically. But there needed to be limits on forest harvest because that protected the other ways they used in new nature, either through hunting or berry picking or recreation. So really what emerges in the kind of 1920s, 1930s is this belief that forests have multiple values and have to be managed for multiple values. Um, and this really comes to, becomes apparent to a lot of people in rural timber country at the beginning of the depression. Um, so again, the depression, you know, nationally and globally had, had many reasons. The, the depression in timber country was especially bad and it had multiple reasons having to do with the complex economics of the, the timber industry and the timber market. But one of the things workers said and, you know, said quite you know vehemently was that one of the reasons one of the things that had caused the depression was over harvest throughout the kind of early 1920s so here you see a chart of essentially the kind of square mileage cut by the timber industry over the course of the early 20th century and you can see that timber uh, companies are harvesting just recklessly and so timber workers say that you know the depression has caused this essentially there's too much you know harvest going on essentially the, the timber industry is putting too much emphasis on the economic value of, of logs and they have, you know, they have to be constrained and protect these other uses of the forests. And this really provides, I think, the, the, one of the major reasons that timber workers turn to organized labor because they see in organized labor a, a powerful tool that they can use to force employers to start restricting 
timber harvests. Now, timber workers were drawn to the labor movement for, for many of the same reasons that workers in other industries are drawn to the labor movement. Better hours, safer working conditions, uh, better wages. And, and that was part of the draw, but really a big part of the draw and why timber workers you know, looked to the IWA was because they believed that it would help them, it would give working people a say in forest management. And this is a quote from, uh, the IWA was founded in 1937. This is a quote from their newspaper a year later, quote, quote, we shall unite in every honest effort to save the forest, real conservation, selective logging, sustained yield, reforestation, fire prevention, coupled with union recognition, union wage scales means sustained prosperity in the lumber industry for all. Um, so you can see they're articulating this idea that, you know, with conservation, we can have jobs and we can have, you know, protected forests. We can have both wilderness and working forests. And the first kind of moment that the, the IWA really tests this out or really intervenes in environmental politics is with Olympic National Park. So at the same time the IWA is being founded, uh, Olympic National Park Park is being debated in, in Congress. And even as late as 1937, FDR doesn't want, want to sign the legislation authorizing the park because he is worried about jobs. And the Forest Service and a lot of timber industry um, lobbyists are coming out and saying, if we create Olympic National Park, it will cost too many jobs. Well, into this kind of phrase steps the IWA and they say, we want Olympic National Park. We want to preserve wilderness um, and that ultimately is one of the things that tips the balance towards um, the creation of Olympic National Park. So the IWA plays a crucial role in this. And in the de debates leading up to Olympic National Park, the, the IWA articulated what ultimately I call working class environmentalism. It's this idea that wilderness and working forests necessarily had to coexist. Um, you know, as I say here, the former, that is to say, a working forest that provided jobs for workers, it economically sustained rural communities, and it provided a crucial commodity that was center at the center of the national and global uh, marketplace, that is to say lumber. Um, while the later, that is to say wilderness, provided opportunities for working class recreation and preserved biological diversity. So, so really that is one of the chief goals of the IWA and that, as I argue, would be kind of one of the the central goals of timber workers throughout the 20th century is an effort to balance working class or working forests alongside wilderness to have both. Now you might think that this might put timber workers into conflict with what was at the time a nascent environmental movement, but quite to the contrary, um, the IWA would ultimately end up working very closely with uh, activists in the wilderness movement and specifically the wilderness society. And many folks in the wilderness society, they weren't themselves workers, but they came from similar geographic and political spaces as timber workers. So here I got Bob Marshall and Aldo Leopold. They were, they were both foresters. They were both founding members of the wilderness society. And both of them believed that, you know, you couldn't just preserve all forest land, that you needed to think about rural communities and you needed to help rural communities by allowing you know, some timber, some active timber, uh, excuse me, some active logging alongside wilderness. And that was the same thing with Benton McKay, another founding member of the Wilderness Society. Benton McKay worked for many New Deal conservation um, groups uh, and agencies. And he also believed that you had to manage the landscape for both wilderness and kind of rural economic benefit. Um, and ultimately, this is um, Howard Zonizer. He believed the same thing. He would become president of the Wilderness Society and ultimately one of the architects of the 1964 Wilderness Act. And I think this quote is really important for revealing how these kind of mid 20th century environmentalists thought about the relationship of kind of between work and nature. Uh, so what Zonizer says here is, quote, our hope in preserving areas, areas of wilderness free from lumbering is dependent on our ability to achieve a prosperous lumbering industry based on sound timber management within the forest and woodlots outside the wilderness. So, you know, I give you this quote, um, and I really rely on this quote in my book because I think what it shows is that in the kind of 1930s and 40s, timber workers and wilderness activists had a very similar view of nature, that we needed both wilderness and working force alongside one another. And this kind of common shared belief that we need both sorts of forest, it really formed the basis of what would become a very, very powerful coalition uh, 
in the mid 20th century. Um, so one of the things my book looks at is kind of how this coalition formed and how the IWA worked alongside the Wilderness Society, um, advocated for many new wilderness areas. Um, among them was the Three Sisters Wilderness, which the IWA and the Wilderness Society jointly worked on, um, expand, uh, worked to expand, um, and several other wilderness areas. And one of the kind of you know big, big kind of turning moment or turning points in my book or a crucial moment in my book is the 1964 Wilderness Act, an act that significantly expanded wilderness um, and created new mechanisms for protecting wilderness. And again, the IWA was a crucial supporter of, of that legislation. Um, and IWA members played crucial roles both at hearings for the bill as well as kind of letter writing campaigns, things that signaled to the Johnson administration, which, which signed the, the 64 Wilderness Act, signaled to the Johnson administration that, you know, workers were in support of this legislation, that timber companies coming out and talking about how this would cost jobs didn't necessarily have the support of the workers. Um, so, you know, if you could go back to 1964 um, and look at this partnership between the Wilderness Society and the IWA that had produced many new wilderness areas and the 64 Wilderness Act, you never would have, probably couldn't have imagined and that ultimately these, you know, by the end of the 20th century, these two groups, workers and environmentalists, would, would be at war with one another. Um, so the third part of my book really looks at kind of what changed and why did this kind of once productive relationship disintegrate? Well, one of the, the big changes that happened was the, the geographic focus, not the geographic focus, but the geographic loci of the environmental movement changed. And one of the things I, I said earlier is that many of the founders of the Wilderness Society came from rural communities or came from the Forest Service, they came from places where they had contact with rural workers and timber workers specifically. Um, partly as a result of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring and the first Earth Day and many other kind of you know, things that, that happened that changed the environmental movement, the environmental movement becomes less of a rural movement and more of an urban movement. So people from cities, they don't necessarily have the same relationship with workers. They don't see them the same way. Uh, the other thing that happens is that a lot of these kind of urban environmentalists, they're coming from the middle class. They pr primarily value the outdoors for recreation and they don't want things like clear cuts and, and industrial activity in nature, marring the way they, they see nature. So they start turning away from kind of that, that multiple use strategy that someone like Zahnheiser had articulated and, more to and they start more believing that kind of preservationism is the only legitimate form of environmental activism and that any form of industrial use mars nature and is therefore an illegitimate use of nature. So essentially they're, they're seeing nature in new ways that doesn't allow this, this partnership to subsist. Uh, the other big thing that happens is that some environmental activists, particularly radical environmental activists, start coming from new political spaces. They start coming from the new left and they start, um, and, you know, again, a lot of labor histor historians have looked at kind of the way the new left of the kind of anti-war movement and part elements of the civil rights movement had a really kind of disparaging take on and the old left of the, the white working class and organized labor. And that was absolutely true in the Northwest, that a lot of these new left and radical environmentalists, they had nothing but disdain for, for kind of workers and absolute you know, contempt for rural workers. Uh, this is a quote from an Oregon environmentalist who was speaking with researcher Stephen Yaffe that I think illustrates the, the new ways that many environmental activists are thinking about workers. Quote, I personally look around at a lot of these loggers and I feel sorry for them. They're uneducated, they're crude, they're not people I would choose to be around. I don't think that there's a defensible reason to keep these people doing what they're doing and in their state of ignorance. So this becomes among many environmentalists, the new dominant narrative about the rural working class, that they're backwards, that they're reactionary, that they're, they're ignorant. And that again, makes it difficult for these two groups to continue working together. Um, and ultimately, it's one of the things that would push these, these two groups into vitriolic conflict. Um, the other thing that happens at the same time is that at the same time, many environmental activists are articulating a new identity for rural workers. Rural workers themselves are adopting a new identity, one that is kind of, that looks askance and looks at suspicion with environmental activists, with urban outsiders, 
Um, and one of the things I talk about in my book is kind of one of the ways I, I chart the, the origins of this new identity is by paying attention to country music. Um, and uh, the, the one figure I talk about a lot is this guy here, you see Buzz Martin. Buzz Martin was, was a logger who became a country and Western singer in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Um, and the title of my book, Strong Winds and Widowmakers, is actually from a Buzz Martin song. But what Buzz Martin essentially articulated was this, this whole, this new identity for rural workers that, you know, we don't need environmentalists, we don't need urban people, they don't understand how hard we work, they don't understand us. Um, so at the same time, like I said, the new left is articulating this new identity for workers, workers themselves are articulating this new identity that, that like I said, look, views outside outsiders with suspicion. And what's going on at the same time as all this is that the economy of the Northwest timber industry is radically changing. Um, a lot of timber companies are closing up their mills in the Northwest. Um, they are moving to the South or they're shipping unmilled timber to Asia. And that creates a lot of economic hardship in rural working communities. And what musicians like Buzz Martin did and what some other kind of cultural products that come out of timber country did was they essentially blamed environmentalists for the economic problems of timber country. So by the end of the 1970s, timber workers believe that a lot of their problems are caused by people in Seattle and Portland or caused by environmental activism, whereas environmentalists believe that timber workers are ruining nature and that they're backwards and that essentially um, there's no problem limiting logging and having an economic impact on the timber industry because they, they don't see those workers necessarily as deserving of their consideration. And, you know, one of the things though, that's, you know, an irony in all this. And one of the things that doesn't get mentioned um, is that even though workers are adopting this new kind of vision of themselves and this new, you know, very confrontational rural identity, they continue to be committed to this idea of working class environmentalism, of blaming or of balancing you know, a working force with wilderness. Um, so one figure I talk about in my book is this guy here, Tom Bauman. Um, he is a very accomplished rock climber. Um, he, he, he did like some first ascents in South America, I believe. Um, and he's kind of very well known among in the climbing community. What most people don't know about him was his day job was he worked as a logger. Um, and, and Bauman actually kind of led, didn't singularly lead, but led this effort to get the menagerie. It's a you know, small wilderness area in the Sentian Valley. Um, he, he really uh, led this effort to get it protected as a wilderness. And this is what he told the Willamette Observer. Um, I worked in the woods all my life. I believe in timber harvesting. That's our economic base here. I don't believe in logging when it comes to what I consider to be one of the gems of the state. Um, so there still is this commitment now to the same kind of working class environmentalism. It's just that environmentalists no longer see that because of the ways identities had changed in the previous decade. And this really lays the foundation of, of what becomes the spotted all conflict is that starting in the 1980s, uh, environmentalists become very concerned at the rate of timber harvesting and they adopt the spotted owl essentially as a, as a very useful legal mechanism to force the, the Forest Service to significantly restrict harvests. Uh, this has a huge and devastating economic impact on people in rural timber working communities. Um, but oftentimes environmentalists don't pay attention to that or they simply don't care. This was a quote by David Bowerman very prominent environmental activist um, in the Spotted Owl era. And what he says is loggers losing their jobs because of Spotted Owl legislation is, in my eyes, no different than people being out of work after the furnaces at Dachau shut down. So you kind of get a, a sense of the way these environmentalists are, are responding to the, the massive economic impacts of efforts to save the Spotted Owl. Um, and workers often respond to this in vitriolic fashion. Um, you know, they, they kind of lean into the kind of Buzz Martin rural identity, the confrontational identity. They start plastering um, their trucks with confrontational bumper stickers. Uh, at some times they actually kill and house from fence posts in their towns. And so, you know, a lot of environmental activists, the media really interpreted a lot of this, um, and not incorrectly, as resistance to the environmental movement. It, it absolutely was, but it wasn't resistance to environmentalism. Essentially, what timber workers in the Spotted Owl era argued was that, you know, just as their predecessors in the IWA had sought a balance between 
and working force and wilderness um, and, and sought to expand wilderness because they thought that, you know, there was too much economic activity in, in the forests. Uh, workers in the 80s and 90s identify another problem. They say, you know, we already have enough wilderness. Um, we have enough protections in place. What we need now is kind of to maintain working forests. Um, and because they feel that the spotted owl conflict or the spotted owl legislation and set asides are, you know, creating essentially runaway preservationism, um, they feel that they're opposed to that. But that doesn't necessarily mean they were opposed to environmental protections. They were just opposed to the, the complete decline of working force. And this is a letter to the editor written by, um, it's actually written by a woman from Mill City um, in Oregon. And what she said was, you know, we don't hate the owl, we don't hate wilderness. We have saved huge segments of the forest for future generations, but you can't put living trees in a museum expecting them to be exempt from the ravages of nature. You can, however, harvest them, replant and manage them wisely to provide beauty, recreation and jobs forever. So again, this woman is still articulating a very similar working class environmentalism that her, you know, that predecessors in the IWA had articulated. It's just that now the environmental movement and the larger public is not so much willing to accept that argument. Um, and, I, and I think this continues to, to be part of forest politics today. Um, so many of you, again, who fo follow forest politics, probably aware of the timber unity movement. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the way the timber unity movement is often covered in the press is as reactionary, as backwards, as wanting to, you know, harvest all the trees and cut all the forests, um, climate change and forest protection be damned. Um, but if you actually talk to some of the folks in timber unity, uh, what you find is that they believe in climate change and that they believe that actually managing forests, not just preserving forests, but managing forests may be one of the best ways to address climate change. And they feel that essentially the legislation uh, being proposed, climate change legislation and cap and trade affects their ability to essentially adequately manage forests in ways that may be beneficial to all. Oh no, again, the science and all this stuff is, is very complex and complicated. I'm not necessarily saying they're right, uh, but I'm saying maybe we should listen to them. Um, so kind of the, the conclusions ultimately my book draws um, and that, you know, I kind of hinted at here is, you know, we, we can't afford to clear cut every forest. Um, obviously, we can't, we can't do that. But neither can we afford to preserve every forest. You know, timber remains a really important commodity. We all live in houses made of timber. Uh, many of us are trying to publish books or have published books. That, those books are printed on paper, which is a forest product. Um, Timber remains central to nearly everyone's day-to-day -day lives. Um, moreover, the timber industry continues to support rural communities in the Northwest. Um, so what we need are forestry policies that make space for both wilderness and working forests. You know, for most of the 20th century, economic activity was the only thing that forced, um, you know, forest policymakers considered. Um, now the pendulum has swing, swung almost too far in the other direction where we have kind of, you know, Preservationism um, really kind of dominates policy discussions. Um, and what I think we need to do is, is make, be, do a better job of making space for both working forests and wilderness. Um, and as I say, you know, throughout the 20th century and into the present, people in timber working communities have really thought about how we achieve that balance. And so, you know, I don't claim that they have all the answers and neither do they claim they have, they have all the answers. But I think by listening to them and and taking seriously their connection to the force, their commitment to the force, the fact that they have known the force in multiple ways, that they value it for multiple reasons and value it in multiple ways, um, we, we may be able to arrive at forestry policies that are beneficial to both you know, the aesthetics and biology of the forest as well as, as rural communities. Um, so, you know, after I say, as I say here, after all, who, who's, who better to guide our force management decisions than the very people who spend their entire lives in the woods, both at work and in recreation and through kind of hunting and fishing. Um, so, so that is kind of the, the main goal of the book and what I hope is one of the takeaways is to, to encourage people to, to not dismiss timber workers um, in forestry discussions, but to really consider what they have to say. So yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Stephen. That's a fascinating topic. Um, I'm sure there will be some interesting questions. Uh, for those of you who would like to ask Steve some questions, please use the chat function and I will share them. Um, Tim Williams already has a question, so I'll pass it on. Um, is this a story of Northwest exceptionalism or are there connections to other regional responses to forest use? Uh, 
Here, Tim's thinking about coal mining in Appalachia or tourism along the Blue Ridge in building the Blue Ridge Highway Parkway. In other words, is this a regional narrative, a national one, or both? Uh, I, I would say, uh, so thank you. That is a wonderful question. Um, I would say it's both. Uh, one of the, the, the ways I got interested in this topic was the exceptional work done by several scholars who have identified uh, other kind of instances of working class environmentalism, particularly in Appalachian coal country and miners resistance to um, kind of, uh, I forget what it's called, essentially where they level the whole mountaintop, um, resistance to that sort of mining or you know efforts by uh, people in the Blue, Blue Ridge Mountains is another kind of example. Uh, rural, both timber workers and coal miners there uh, attempt to expand wilderness. So there is a, a long history of working class environmentalism throughout uh, the nation, if not the world, work that, you know, I'm, I'm kind of contributing one chapter uh, to this, this broader history of working class environmentalism. Um, at the same time, there are some things that are unique about the Northwest. So again, this is why I say it's both um, a national and regional story. Um, the dynamics of timber harvesting, the ecological dynamics of timber harvesting are a bit different than coal mining. Uh, the way we, we can affect, you know, we can, the way we ecologically responsibly manage coal and fossil fuels, I think is fundamentally different than the way we can and should manage forests, which, which makes this story somewhat unique. But um, there's, you know, there's some parallels to not necessarily other parts of the US, but definitely other parts of Canada. Um, outside the kind of Canadian Northwest where um, you see kind of timber workers making kind of these, these similar arguments. So yeah, thank you. That was a good question. Next question is from your colleague, Julie Hessler, who asks, what role do the timber corporations play in your story? You didn't really talk all that much about them. Say a little bit more about yeah. that, Stephen. Uh, yeah, thank you, Julie. Uh, complicated. Um, so in, you know, from roughly 1900 to the 1970s, uh, the, the, the timber, country, uh, timber corporations are the bad guys in my story, right? Um, I'm a labor historian. I am contractually bound to, to treat capital as the bad guy in my stories. Um, one of the things I talk about in my book, though, uh, is in the 1970s, the structure of the timber industry really changes. And the capitalism in the Northwest woods really changes after the 1970s. So in the 1970s, you know, Weyerhaeuser still has some land holdings, but they're really not producing a lot of timber, uh, given the financialization of capital in the late 20th century. The way you make money as a timber corporation in the late 20th century is not by harvesting timber. It's by real estate investment. Um, it is by manipulating markets. Um, yeah, essentially Weyerhaeuser in the 1970s and beyond becomes a real estate management company. Um, so production actually shifts to independent contract loggers, which are these kind of small crews of loggers, and it shifts to small family owned mills. And the, the dividing lines between worker and boss in both those new categories becomes really porous and difficult to pay attention to. Um, so one of the things I, I talk about, I didn't go into detail in my talk here, but this is something I definitely go into detail in the book. Um, is that essentially a rural identity replaces a working class identity in the 1970s and beyond. Essentially workers no longer see themselves as having, you know, they're not no longer opposed to their bosses because it's not so clear who the bosses are. Um, and that animosity they once directed at their bosses gets redirected to the environmental movement. So one of the unique things about the spotted owl conflict in the, the history of labor conflict is that this is a movement where, where bosses and workers are aligned against the environmental movement. Um, and again, I think a lot of that has to do with the ways in which capitalism was, was fundamentally reshaped in the late 20th century. So the next question is, um, can you talk a little bit about any oral history aspects to your research? How did you find people to talk to? Are there any parts of the conversations that you didn't expect? Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I do a lot of oral history. One of my favorite parts of this project is getting to talk to timber workers. Um, so really, I, I have no great secret for, for finding people to talk to. Uh, well, actually, no. Uh, I mean, I'll tell a story after this. But um, essentially, it's one of those things where you find one person who tells you to go talk to another person, go talk to another person. And that's the way I found most of my oral histories. Uh, the one exception is uh, one of the ways uh, it occurred to me that there may be a complex story about workers in nature uh, was in graduate school. Um, one of the reasons, uh, so I went to graduate school in the Northwest in Seattle. And one of the reasons I came to the, 
maybe I shouldn't say this. One of the reasons I came to graduate school in the Northwest was because there's really good fishing. Um, and pretty much all my major life decisions have been made about what's going to put me closer to good fishing. Uh, so the thing is, if, if you fish for salmon or steelhead in the Northwest, which I do, uh, that's going to take you to rural communities. And if you're fishing uh, on, in a salmon and steelhead river in the Northwest, you're going to encounter a lot of timber workers, like a lot of timber workers. Uh, I kept running into timber workers constantly. Um, so I just started asking them questions. And eventually I said, hey, I study this, can I interview you? Um, but this was actually very convenient for me because then I could tell my dissertation advisor like I was doing research when I was actually fishing all weekend. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's another way I kind of found people to, to um, speak with. Um, so yeah, in terms of surprises or what I learned, I mean, oh, so much. I mean, really uh, the kind of conservationist attitude and ethic that is so central to the identity of, of a lot of loggers, that they see themselves as, uh, you know, really some of the best environmentalists. Uh, another funny story. Uh, one time I get a, I get a name of a, a logger uh, from another logger I'd interviewed. Um, and I call him up and I say, hey, so-and-so give me your name. Um, I'm writing this book. Uh, you know, can I interview you? Interview you? And he goes, well, what's your book about? And I'm like, well, again, I give him the short speech. I, you know, I argue that workers are environmentalists. He goes, hell, everybody knows that. No one's going to read your book. Um, so I, I just thought it was funny. Like, well, actually, where I live in Eugene, most people don't think that. But it was kind of that, that, that assertion that, well, everyone knows workers are environmentalists. Why are you writing a book about that? Um, so one of the surprising things was not only the conservationist ethic of, of timber workers, but they take it for granted um, that they are, that their conservationist ethic is known. Um, and again, uh, as often as I explained this worker, like, well, actually, I think it, where I live in Eugene, that's not the consensus. Um, so there could be some benefit from, from those people here in your story. So he ultimately gave me a great interview, but. Uh, so the next question is, uh, I'm going to combine two questions because they overlap. Um, they're from Tara Keegan and Jason Herbert. You talk about moving forward on policy by incorporating what workers who really know the forest think and want. Where do you see indigenous knowledge about ecology, forest management fitting into the picture as far as policy goes? What about when these ideas butt heads? And do you see that do rural foresters needs and beliefs align with indigenous people in the area? Are there conflicts, alliances? Yeah, wonderful question. Thank you for that. Um, so this was actually one of the areas in the book I really wanted to go into in a lot more depth. Uh, and unfortunately, I couldn't, uh, just word limits and, and space. But yeah, actually, I find a lot of alignment between kind of both historical and contemporary indigenous land use practices and prescriptions and working class, rural working class environmental uses and prescriptions. Of course, they don't always align. Um, but th there's a lot, lot, lot of agreement about active management being a tool of preventing fire, of you know, encouraging growth, of benefiting ecological diversity. Um, and again, active management is, is a broad category that has a lot of meanings. But um, yeah, so obviously, I you know, Indigenous people have to be part of the conversation along the rural, alongside the rural working class, and Indigenous people more so than the rural working class have been marginalized, historically marginalized from forest use conversations. Um, but that is one of they are a key stakeholder who have to be part of this conversation. Um, you know, during the OHC's kind of meeting a couple of weeks ago, um, I mentioned this, but you know, one of the things kind of where my book ends on a, on a hopeful note, and one of the, the the things I hope that will become more standard are collaborative land use partnerships, um, where essentially you get land, public land managers, environmentalists, rural workers, and oftentimes indigenous communities all coming together at a table, hashing out their ideas. Oftentimes there's differences, but at least they're discussing differences and finding a compromise um, instead of kind of the historical way of doing things where the environmental movement uh, uses its kind of legal and political power to steer things in one direction, or timber capital uses its legal and political power to steer things in one direction. Um, so yeah, indigenous groups have participated in some cooperative land use partnerships, um, and I hope that trend continues. Um, and again, you know, the thing with cooperative land use partnerships is everyone doesn't have to agree on the best way forward, they just have to agree on a way forward. And it is a way of kind of, you know, dealing with, with multiple and conflicting visions and arriving at a solution that no one necessarily is happy with, but everyone can live with. Um, and often, I think a lot of research has shown too that ultimately collaborative land use partnerships pr produce some of the best ecological results, not just the best political results. So, so the next question uh, has to do with uh, 
uh, wildfires. Mm -hmm. um, do you discuss the issue of wildfires in the book at all, especially as we continue to experience li large uncontrollable fires and we see more drought and management of forests? I was just hearing on NPR this morning, I think, about a controversy around um, uh, clearing of, of the fires, of the, tr the trees that were burned mm -hmm. uh, in the, um, the fire this summer. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, fire is something I, I talk about in the book. Um, so yeah, as you as I talked about, the book is 1900 to the present, um, which sounded good at the time. But one of the problems is that, you know, something's always happening that I got to then cram into the final chapter of the conclusion. Um, so the timber unity movement was one of those things uh, that emerged kind of as I was writing this book. But then this, especially after the devastating wildfires this summer, I'm like, well, I got to Put some new information in about fires. I already had some stuff about fires, but uh, put a little bit more. Um, so yeah, fire is something I definitely talk about. Um, and one of the reasons, uh, and again, the, the science on fire is complex. Um, there are a lot of different ideas about how we, we better manage the forest to limit catastrophic fires. Um, there is some research that suggests, and this is what I present in my book though, is that one of the reasons that fires have become so out of control is obviously climate change. That is undeniable, but also prohibitions on, prohibitions on active forest management that resulted from the Spotted Owl conflict essentially became really difficult for land managers to do even non-commercial things in the forest, like clearing brush or thinning or controlled burns, uh, because environmental some environmental groups became really effective at blocking any sort of active management strategies. And that's one of the th reasons the fuel load has built up in a lot of public forests. Um, so that's obviously, again, not the only reason. But again, timber workers have long said that by looking at more active forest management, that is one of the things that will reduce fire. Um, and that is one of the arguments that, you know, timber workers have made this summer was that like, listen, one of the reasons we have these fires is because, you know, Logging on public lands has all been shut down. The fuel load is way too high and we need to thin those forests, um, both commercial and non-commercial through non-commercial activities in order to reduce those, those fuel loads. Um, so yeah, it's something I pay attention to, but fire, several historians have written about fire. It's his own book. The, the ecology of fire is complex and fascinating, um, but yeah, thank you. The next question is from Joe Mall, who's uh, from the McKenzie River Trust. He's asking, what's your read today on the trend line for trust between the forestry world and the conservation community? Growing trust, growing distrust, where do you come out on that? Uh, before a couple of years ago, I would have said growing trust. Uh, again, talking about cooperative land use partnerships. Um, I'm like, hey, this is great. We're moving in the right direction. Uh, I think the cap and trade bill and the timber unity movement uh, Maybe now I would say growing distrust, um, just because the, the cap and trade bill, uh, it really didn't consider kind of rural communities and how they would be impacted. And then timber unity, while, you know, my book is generally favorable to them, I think you got to admit that there some of their tactics are very, very divisive and are doing more to discourage cooperation and conversation than encourage it. Um, so yeah, I think as of kind of, you know, late April, 2021, I would say maybe things, at least with cap and trade aren't going in the right direction. Um, but I think in terms of, you know, collaborative land use partnerships, um, you know, some in like watershed uh, councils throughout, you know, the Northwest, um, they are bearing some fruit and, and, you know, looking good. So yeah, I, I kind of, that was a very unequivocal answer, but that, I think that's the best I can do at the moment is that in some places things look good in other places, not so much. So uh, the next question is from uh, Troy Brundage, who's a PhD candidate in the geography program. And uh, this is an interesting and uh, a challenging question, I think. In attempting to hold space for the working class environmental voice, is it challenging to table the discussion of colonialism and the social construction of white working class birthright to land? Or on the contrary, is that part of the investigation? Fabulous question. Uh, but part of me is, is, is like, oh yeah, you had to save that right, right for the end when we're running out of time. And the other part of me is like, oh, thank God, save that for right at the end when we're running out of time. Uh, that is actually a, a question I have struggled with since the start of this class. Or, since the start of this project, right? Um, is that, yeah, rural communities are making a claim to the land. They are making a claim to, you know, we have worked this land for generations. We know how to manage it because our 
fathers and grandfathers were, were worked this you know same land. Um, listen to us and how we management. And, and as you point out, very rightly, that rests on a foundation of settler colonialism. Um, and oftentimes, not not oftentimes, regularly, with few exceptions, there is an, there's no acknowledgement or there. With few exceptions, uh, there is an acknowledgement of indigenous land use and that you know, native peoples had been here before, except when it serves kind of the rural working class to do that. You know, when they can compare themselves to indigenous land use practices and kind of make a claim to the ecological Indian stereotype, then they'll, then they'll evoke native history, but, but no other time do they evoke native history. So that's, that's something I struggled with is right. Ultimately, this is the, the major question is who has the rights to say how we manage the landscape. Um, and yeah, I, I think that you, you, you point out a potential important criticism of my work is that by making, you know, by trying to center the, the rural working class, I am excluding indigenous peoples. And, and that is a problem. Um, and one, like I said, I've struggled with and wrestled with and thought about ways to, to do it without any, any good, uh, good solutions. So uh, this this will be our last question. This one's from Abigail Fine uh, in the School of Music and Dance. Have loggers in the Pacific Northwest historically been descended from immigrant groups? Mm -hmm. And if so, have aspects of that heritage or folklore shaped their understanding of nature? Uh, Abigail, I'm gonna skip the parenthetical. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead, well, yeah wonderful question, uh, Abigail. Thank you so much. So yes, absolutely. Uh, most timber workers, uh, especially in the early 1900s, were were immigrants. Uh, Scandinavian immigrants were overrepresented. Um, they were the, the largest kind of demographic group, followed by Eastern European immigrants, um, mostly from Italy and Greece. Um, so essentially, when the timber industry is emerging, that is the peak of what historians call third wave immigration. And you know, like in other parts of industrializing America, employers realize, hey, let's turn to immigrant labor because we can pay them less. Um, so, so that's that's absolutely what they do. So, yeah, these these timber workers become part of are this kind of longer history of um, you know immigration in America and many you know timber working communities today. Uh, a lot of them like see a lot of Scandinavian names e even today um, uh, in kind of timber working communities. Um, in terms of the ways in which folklore from kind of, especially Scandinavian countries might've influenced working class ideas about nature. You know, I had never considered that. That's fascinating. So one of the things I do chart um, is that a lot of these immigrants brought radicalism with them. Uh, they often brought some kind of working class ideas of environmentalism with them, uh, especially Scandinavian and Swedish timber workers who kind of had this kind of conservationist ethic in some of their unions uh, prior to the, their immigration. So that's one of the things I talk about, but God, folklore, I never would have considered it. Well, crap, Abby, I'm going to have to scrap the book now and start again, because that, that seems like too interesting a question to ignore. Well, maybe that, maybe a second book, maybe you and I can collaborate because that sounds like a really interesting question I didn't consider that I think is worth considering. So, um, Stephen, the well, last question: uh, Any idea about when this book is going to see the pin printed page? Uh, so, hopefully, my publisher tells me kind of either late fall, early winter. Fingers crossed. But we all know how crazy and unpredictable academic publishing is. So, um, yeah. So that that's what I'm hoping is that we we can all have a hard copy by. Um, you can give it as a gift for Christmas next year. Well, we will hope for that. I want to thank everyone for joining us uh, for this fascinating talk. Thank you very much, Professor Stephen Bita, for your work in talk, progress talk. It's just completely fascinating uh, topic and material. It's been a real pleasure. Um, for more information about the Oregon Humanities Center and our upcoming sponsored events, or if you'd like to contribute to supporting our research and public programs, go to ohc.uoregon.edu, and we'll see you next time.